Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue our way through Farish Homeric Greek, a book for beginners, continuing with Lesson 9, which presents the imperfect of omega verbs. Now, generally speaking, the tenses of Greek verbs are divided into two groupings, that of primary tenses and of secondary tenses. The primary tenses of the indicative are the present, the future, the perfect, and the future perfect. The past or secondary tenses are the imperfect, the aorist, and the pluperfect, and these are also called historical tenses. The general idea is that the principal primary tenses refer to either the present or the future, whereas the historical past secondary tenses refer to the past. Now, the tenses in Greek, as I said in the earlier video, are more complex because Greek does not use auxiliaries like would, should, shall, will that are instrumental to our English marking of tenses, but rather the tense, all those types of designations are contained within the formation of the, of the single verb itself. So that means that ultimately you're going to have various tense systems where these systems support several tenses. Now, here there are nine, but I'm going to only look at the first uh, four because those will be what we'll be looking at in the coming, immediately coming lessons. So first is a present tense system, which upon which is constructed not only the present, but the imperfect tense forms. Then you have the future, which supports the future alone. And then you have the first aorist, which supports the first aorist, active and middle. And then the second aorist, which consists of the second aorist, active and middle. So each of these systems will be marked out by certain tense suffixes, which we'll see next. So each of these systems has a stem called the tense stem, to which certain endings are added to denote person and number. So you'll see the, uh, here, reading Smythe 455, the tense suffixes, which are added to the verb stem to form the tense stems, consists of the thematic vowel and certain other letters. We saw what the thematic vowel was in our earlier lecture. No tense suffixes are added to the verb stem. One, in the second aorist active and middle, and the second perfect and pluperfect of me verbs, and two, in the perfect and pluperfect middle of verbs in omega and med. The tense suffixes are as follows. The present system, you see there are quite a few tense suffixes in the present system, and we'll have a video dedicated to the various ways of forming the present stem. So let's not worry about that right now. Let's concentrate on the future system, number two, which is marked by sigma with the thematic vowel variation between omega and epsilon that we've already seen in the present. And then we have the first aorist system, which again is marked by sigma, but sigma with it followed by an alpha. So the sigma alpha is going to be our characteristic of the first aorist system and first aorist tenses, as we'll see going forward. And then we have the second aorist system, which is built on a stem that's different from that of the present, but itself is followed by, again, the thematic vowels, omicron and epsilon varying. I I'm not going to worry about the on none because we'll get to that later. Those are the med verbs from iste me, etc. Okay. So, 
Dealing with these past tenses, the most important thing you have to understand is that the phenomenon of the augment. The augment denotes past time. It appears only in the secondary or past tenses of the indicative mood, namely in the imperfect, the aorist, and the pluperfect. The augment has two forms, the syllabic and the temporal. So, what is the syllabic augment? Reading Smythe 429. The syllabic augment, verbs beginning with a consonant, prefix epsilon as the augment, which thus increases the word by one syllable. In the pluperfect, the epsilon is prefixed to the reduplication. And we'll learn what the reduplication is when we get to the perfect. But if you just look at this first example, luo, which we should recognize as the present indicative first person singular of loose, the next form, which is the imperfect, eluon, it uses the same stem, but you see the epsilon prefixed to it to mark the imperfect tense, or to mark a past tense, and it's the, the, the uh, stem and the endings that mark it as imperfect. Likewise, in that less, next form, elusa, you have the epsilon prefixed as the syllabic augment to the verb stem of the first aorist. And likewise, with pi deu o, e pi deu on, e pi deu sa, the e, e is your syllabic augment. And you'll see under a, verbs that begin with a row double the row before the augment. So, rip do throw has eripton for its imperfect, that row having been doubled, and so on. Now the temporal augment is a little different. Verbs beginning with a vowel take the temporal augment by lengthening the initial vowel. The temporal augment is so called because it increases the time required to pronounce the initial syllable. Diphthongs lengthen their first vowel. So we see that a becomes a, epsilon becomes eta, a becomes eta, epsilon becomes eta, iota varies between its short and long forms, omicron becomes omega, upsilon short becomes upsilon long, alpha iota becomes eta with iota subscript, alpha upsilon becomes eta upsilon, Epsilon Yoda becomes Eta with Yoda subscript. Epsilon Ups, Upsilon becomes Eta Upsilon. And Omicron Yoda becomes Omega with Yoda subscript. So you have Ago becoming Agon. Elpizdon becoming Elpizdon. Hiketeuo becoming Hiketeuon. Orizdo becoming Orizdon, etc. And one will get used to this uh, temporal augment. It's not very hard to spot as long as you are familiar with the verb that you are working with to begin with. Now, um, you do have instances of augments of so called lost consonant verbs, and this is far. Verbs beginning with a vowel formally preceded by a lost consonant, usually digamma or sigma, may take the syllabic instead of the temporal augment, as handanon, which is the perfect imperfect of handano, from swandano, to please. When uh, reading eight thirty six, when initial sigma has been lost. The augment always contracts with the first vowel of the stem, according to the rule of contraction. When the final, when the initial digamma has been lost, contraction may or may not take place. So he gives you these examples: um, echo becoming imperfect, a con, um, hepomai, hepomain, adon being the second aorist of horao, and. Uh, Agnume 
having its aorus at oxa. And these are, uh, I mean, this is just a taste of how complex the principal parts of Greek verbs are, and they really do constitute um, the singular challenge of learning Greek. But if you're uh, ambitious or are consolidating, reconsolidating your Greek, you might look at Smythe section 431, where he details all the verbs that behave this way. And it's a very good list to familiarize yourself with because these can present a stumbling block when encountered in text, if you don't know what's happening. Okay, the augments of compound verbs. Compound verbs occur when some prepositions, which were originally adverbs, are prefixed to verbs, the whole forming a compound. If the preposition ends in a vowel and the verb begins with a vowel, the vowel of the preposition is usually elided. So, the isteme from diaisteme and apairao from apoirao. So, you see, in each case, the alpha has been elided of dia and the omicron of apo, and uh, the pi has become a pi. Um, by virtue of the aspiration over the diphthong alpha iota, a pi ra o. So when you come to augmenting these verbs, these compound verbs, the augment of compound verbs comes between the preposition and the verb. If two vowels are thus brought together, the first is usually elided. So apa lu o becomes in the perfect ape lu on. And in the aorist, ape lu sa. So you see that the Omicron has disappeared and the augment has taken its place. Ape lu on and ape lu sa. So Homer has some flexibility here. The augment, both syllabic and temporal, is often omitted in Homer, but that's really an imprecise way of speaking. Uh, one of my favorite sections of Smythe, the note after section 438, tells us that in Homer, the absence of the augment represents the usage of the parent language in which the augment was not necessarily added to mark past time. It is therefore erroneous historically to speak of the omission of the augment in Homer. Because in actual fact, without the augment, one can still see that a verb form is past, an indicative verb form is of a past tense by virtue of either the stem or the endings or both. So we will see this as we move forward. The augment is in some sense redundant and in Homer or superfluous and in Homer, it can be omitted. Now, what's the meaning of the imperfect? The imperfect, Tense denotes the continuance of an action in past time, customary action or repeated action. So, eluon means I loosed, and it would show someone loosening the knot over a period of time, like a video. Eluon, I loosed, I was loosing, or I kept loosing, or I was, a, I was accustomed to lose. So, it represents the action in the way a video does as opposed to a snapshot, and a snapshot will be represented by the aorist tense, which we're going to be learning next. Now, the stem to which the endings of the imperfect are attached is in the imperfect identical with that of the present. So if we look at this form of the first person singular of luo in the imperfect, we see lambda upsilon, the same stem that we had in the present, but with, on the one hand, the augment, on the other hand, the secondary tense, uh, the secondary personal endings. And so the imperfect, as Farr explains in 840, the imperfect is formed by adding the secondary endings to the augmented stem of the present. As luo, 
I loose becomes e lu on, I was loosing. And so here we have in this chart, the secondary tense personal endings, on, s, e, omen, ete, on. And one should just write out this schema 30 or 40 times today, do it again 30 or 40 times tomorrow, and recite it again and again until it's actually branded in your brain as a schema of six forms. Don't worry about the dual right now. That will take care of itself down the road. On, S, E, Omen, Ete, On. And you'll see that the first person singular and the third person plural are identical. So there's some ease there in learning this set of six forms. So here we have the con full conjugation of Luo in the imperfect, and I'll ignore the duals. Eluon, Elues, Elue, Eluomen, Eluete, Eluon. Eluon, Elues, Elue, Eluomen, Eluete, Eluon. Now, verbs demonstrate this, what's called a recessive accent. An action is called recessive when it moves back as far from the end of the word as the quantity of the ultima, the last syllable, permits. The quantity of the penal, the second from the last syllable, does not matter. It's disregarded. So, reading Smythe 423, simple or compound verbs usually slow, throw the accent as far back as the quantity of the last syllable permits. This is called, again, a recessive accent. So you see in the three forms, luo, luomen, and luomen, you see that in that third form, the eta being a long, eta nu, eta being long, it pulls the acute accent one step forward. And so that acute accent occurs on the second from the last syllable. And so too in all of the rest of these examples. Pai deu o, pai deu se, but pai deu e tain. Apobalo, apobale, but, uh, oh, apobalo, okay, that, lo, that omega pulls it forward, but apobale, the epsilon allows it to be recede all the way back. And apolu o, again, the omega pulls it forward. But apelu on, the Omicron nu allows it to be all the way back, and etc. There are some exceptions to this general rule of the recession, recessive nature of verbs, accents, the most important of which, or the first of which, are the enclitics. But if you want to review them all, look at the subsections to 4, to 4 in Smythe. So here we have the present and the imperfect active contrasted of Luane to release. Luo, Lues, Lue, Luomen, Luete, Luce, versus Eluon, Elues, Elue, Eluomen, Eluete, Eluon. And if you look at these and examine them, you'll see the action of the rule of recessive action accent in forms like uh let's see um eluete where that accent has to come forward well they're all going back all the way to the, th to the third from the end i see this isn't really a good example of, of the recessive accent because the there's no, there's no real case where it's being pulled forward by a long, by a long final, final consonant. I apologize. But anyways, these are the forms that you should master um, to be up to snuff to this point. Notice again that both the present and the perfect use the same stem, lambda upsilon, in the case of luo, but that they are distinguished by the augment and the different endings, personal endings. Okay.
So finally, we have our vocabulary for chapter nine. Alei argeos de, which is a suffix meaning two. So Athenes de means to Athens. Dia, preposition meaning through, on account of, or by means of, during, depending on whether it's followed by the genitive or accusative, and it's also an adverb, meaning between or among. The prepositions can be a little complex. Dei pilos, ero, emos, eme, emon, ergon, ergu, to ergon, den, which again is a suffix meaning from, so Atene ten means from Athens. Clytumnestre, Clytumnestra, the wife of Agamemnon. Montosune, Oikos, Ho Oikos, Olympios, Olympiae, Olympion, Olympos, Ho Olympos. Priamos, ho priamos, sos se son. Notice sos se son, the possessive pronoun of the second person, your or yours, your car, versus my or mine, my car, my car, emos, ma, emon. Okay, so that's it for lesson 10. Good luck, continue to work hard and have a very good day. Bye-bye.